Uh, my name is Nasala and I am a Kathmandu girl. Kathmandu girl wakes up early. Even on day she's away and does not need to walk her hyperactive dog. Kathmandu girl is a tall baby who needs to get to bed by nine but will stay up for stars and conversations with friends and seldom love her. Kathmandu girl spent four years in an engineering school because her parents thought it was a good idea, but her compass still does not point north. It doesn't help that she's short-sighted and no amount of carrots will help her see the monsoon puddles or a future. Kathmandu girl wants to blame the pollution over her short-sightedness for the diminished number of stars above a terrace. Kathmandu girl covers the tan lines on her traveling feet with sneakers and trekking boots. Kathmandu girl put off a birthday hike because her mother didn't think it was a good idea to go alone in such bad weather. Kathmandu girl braves the tilting buses with Myla Arakshan seats and traveling limbs on days she's late for work. Alone? Kathmandu girl traveled to Chitwan the following week. Alone? Not in an engineering job, but to write poems with the young ones there about the places that make them. Kathmandu girl knows people are made of places, but finds falling in love with people harder than falling in love with dogs and trees. Kathmandu girl thinks purple jack randoms live only along the streets of Kathmandu and finds them alien in the middle of forest in Gorkha. Kathmandu girl has to remind herself to stop counting the types of birds she sees in the Gorkha forest, but won't, until she reaches 10. Kathmandu girl doesn't count hens, even though she doesn't eat them because they're birds and they have bills. Kathmandu girl wishes she had a place of her own, minus the bills and responsibilities, away from the queues of Kathmandu. But Kathmandu girl has a dog and her mom, in that particular order, waiting for her back home. Um, so what you just heard is a spoken word poem. Uh, like I mentioned in my poem, I studied engineering, uh, mostly because my parents wanted me to and I didn't know what else to do. But the time I spent there, I was why they call BE, Bachelors of Engineering, and back exams. <laughs> um, so the time I spent there, I divided my time between having a lot of fun and under extreme stress, mostly because I hate exams. Now, I know everybody hates exams, uh, but I particularly didn't like exams and hated exams because the three hours that I spent giving exams measured my exam giving capacity rather than what I'd learned and knew and could do. Um, <laughs> so I, I was caught in this cycle where I was not studying well because I was dissatisfied with how the exam, everything was so exam oriented and I ended up not giving my exams well as well. So it got to a point where I was very, um, I was very apathetic about how it was. I was caught in this blob um, of apathy where I was actually considering if I should give up engineering, but I was already halfway through. But, uh, so it also made me think about um, if engineering was the thing for me. But I had a set of friends already, and I was halfway through the school, so I didn't really think of, th I didn't really feel like I could uproot myself from that and try and s find something that I really liked somewhere else. So I just settled, settled into the routine. Um, and, but I also had to think about my parents, because um, they are from newer families, eldest siblings, um, they could, taught their younger siblings engineering, um, and they themselves ended up being not very um, highly educated in terms of academia. So I just stuck with it, completed the four years, um, and thankfully I found spoken word poetry, or rather spoken word poetry found me. 
uh, back in 2012 when I was just doing my engineering, uh, I found this video of an American spoken word poet called Sarah Kay. Um, I don't know if you've heard of her, but like you should definitely go and check her out. Uh, so I found this poem by her that is a love letter from a bicycle tire to a toothbrush. Now, to this point, I had dabbled in prose writing a little, but I never thought I could do poetry. But when I watched her turn something so mundane, so everyday, like a toothbrush and a bicycle tire, into something so funny and beautiful, I thought maybe that's something that I wanted to do as well. Uh, and what happened, and so I just started looking up a lot, looking her up a lot and started sharing. Um, I had a huge crush on her as well. <laughs> so, um, and after that, I, and what happened after that has led me to believe that like the universe has a way of aligning things for you and making things happen. Because uh, what are the odds that a recently made friend would let me know that um, Sarah was Skyping in from US here to here. Uh, so I went to the event and there I found my friends from the Word Warriors. Um, some of them are here in the crowd. Uh, so I found the Word Warriors and um, they are, at that point they were working a little but they were mostly a Facebook group on Facebook. <laughs> they were a Facebook group that was around 800 people strong. And um, I added myself to the group and just geek myself out on the poetry there. Um, and I started writing a little and I started posting. And it was there that I really learned to get honest, constructive criticism because up until that point, my friends read my poetry and my writing, but they never really gave me but like when I posted things there, I some of the comments that I got were framed very nicely, but it made me flinch and really rethink if I could write at all. But <laughs> but that's where I really learned to get constructive criticism. Um, later that year, Sarah came in uh, with the help of Word Warriors and Word Warriors parent company Kyoto School and the US MC to do a workshop with 20 odd young people. And I was fortunate enough to be a part of it. Um, when I remember what I actually had actually sent for the selection process, it was an atrociously cheesy poem. So it was a wonder that I got in at all, but um, that happened. And during the time that I spent in the workshop, um, we learned the basics of writing and performing spoken word poetry. And I know that might sound a little simple right now, but like what I had found right then and there really blew me away. Because I, what I had found was a way to express myself um, in ways that I had not previously thought I could do. And I had words for what I was doing, like metaphors and similes and, okay, you gotta stand like this. Um, so things like that, which really helped me think about I wanted to do poetry. Um, so, and after I went back to college in my classes, I went back to the routine, but um, in some ways I could not stop thinking about how like myself I felt during the workshop days. Um, I eventually finished my engineering um, after the four years. Um, I bummed around quite a bit, doing nothing in particular, and sometimes I used to hang around in QC, which is like the word where, you, where the word warriors hang around. And um, and what happened that day really changed my life around. Uh, one day I was just browsing through the books, and my now bosses sat me down and between cutely bickering among themselves, offered me the job I have now. There was nothing dramatic about it, no music, no lights, <laughs> but um, just a quiet conversation in a large room full of books and warm light. But what happened, what, but that just has changed my life in ways that is irreversible and very radical. Um, right now, I am a spoken word poet with the Word Warriors. 
I am a feminist, hardcore. I am also a program coordinator uh, for a project called the Book Bus that QC runs. Um, and for my work, I go into classrooms. Basically, I speak for a living. <laughs> Uh, whether it's in a classroom or in, on a stage or over the phone. Um, but despite speaking so much, I really have a hard time like, coming out and talking myself. I was there in the corner like, trying to be as small as possible. Um, but So the, the poem you heard earlier was how I tell my stories. How I, so it was my cheat code to like, tell the story. Um, besides being my way of showing what it is that I really do when I'm saying I am a spoken word poet. <laughs> uh, so, and for my work, I go into a lot of class. Uh, my work, whether it's like writing poetry or teaching or organizing things, has really been my therapy for a while. Um, and when I go into, I get to travel in Nepal quite a bit. Um, I go into classrooms different private schools, public schools, trust schools, um, and whichever classroom I go into, I'm most likely to find the boys sitting in a row, the girls sitting in separate rows, and the boys are always louder than the girls, and the girls think they're good at language and, uh, language and biology, and the boys think they're good at mathematics and physics, and they both think that poetry is for dead people. <laughs> but, and for my work, what I try to do is create a space that is sort of an intersection, a gray area which is both safe and challenging for them, where they get to rethink what they know, what they are, and try and be more open about learning. And it helps that I have a name that sounds like Mosala. So every time I go into a classroom and introduce myself, there's always laughter. Um, and sometimes they ask me the odd question if what my name means. And, and that is what I think learning should really be about, should be laughter. And that, sh that is unhib uninhibited. And it should be questions and quiet contemplation. Um, my, uh, what I do right now is has been my therapy and but my mother is part of in on it right now because uh, she doesn't quite understand what it is that I do because like I'm like spread out all over the place um, but she doesn't question me when I'm late from work or if I'm late from events like these or if I'm away for weeks on ends um, she brings up engineering sometimes when I'm like I'm always broke, <laughs> but, um, and I've not really considered what I would have been if I was like a certified engineer, um, building Nepal, <laughs> but um, I would like to believe that I would, I would have found a way to grow with it and to touch people's lives, um, but sometimes when I'm sitting in, in my office space, involved in like heated discussion about feminism and all the wonderful things that we talk about, um, I cannot help but feel very, very grateful for all that I have right now. Um, two years down the line, I find that I talk a lot more. I read, I write, um, and talk a little more. <laughs> but through that all, I find that I'm, that I am changing and evolving and shifting with all of it. And through it all, I feel that I am trying to become a better person who is more empathetic, who is more vulnerable, who is more who's stronger. Um, and sometimes I feel all of it at the same time and that just makes me happy. Thanks.